My name is Polly Morris from Monadnock Voices for Prevention. I am the Regional Prevention Coordinator for the Misuse of Alcohol and Drugs. Today we are doing a presentation on prevention in response to a survey that we had sent out to you earlier to ask you what you knew about substance use disorder, what you wanted to know, and how you wanted to learn it. And so you again said face-to-face -face and printed materials. So here we are face-to-face -face, and there are binders on the table if you haven't already gotten one and that's the printed materials for all the learning sessions and then we're going to add some in front of you you have some handouts on the table um, about the uh, prevention information that we're going to talk about today so first off I'm going to ask you a question what is prevention so when you think of prevention, what do you think of? What is prevention? I didn't put a plant in the audience, so um, it's up to you guys to make the response. When you think of prevention, what do you think of? Stopping something before it happens. So stopping something before it happens. Being proactive. Being proactive. Anybody else? When you think of prevention. Educating. Educating. Asset building. I'm repeating it for the so that they can hear it nice and loud. What else? You think of prevention, and this is of course pertaining to substance use, substance misuse, substance abuse. What do you think of? Controlling access. Controlling access. Tell me more about that. What do you mean? Controlling access to substances that can be misused. If you don't have access to them, then you can't misuse them. Okay, so if you don't have access to the substances, you can't misuse them. Reducing risk. Reducing risk. Are you with me, Elise? Mm -hmm. Anything else that you can think of? Nobody said data. When I think of prevention, I think of data. information. So here is a definition of prevention delivered prior to the onset of a disorder these interventions are intended to prevent or reduce the risk of developing a behavioral health problem such as underage alcohol use, prescription drug misuse and abuse, and illicit drug use and that's from NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So today we're going to talk about, go ahead, we're going to talk about the Strategic Prevention Framework. This is the SPIF, the SPIF flower is what I call it. So, and this is, this is a process that helps we as a community decide what activities we're going to do to address issues that we have in the community and to identify what the issues are. So the Strategic Prevention Framework it's an engagement model that was developed by SAMHSA, which is a the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration. Um, and they developed this for communities and states to implement so they could identify problems in their communities and address, the address them with evidence-based strategies. You have the history of the SPIF on the table in front of you, and you have a single handout sheet. So a little, just a, a touch on the history the strategic prevention framework model was implemented um, in the late 90s because while there were coalition work and community work being done, um, it wasn't sustainable. There wasn't a lot of evidence-based practices being used. So SAMHSA developed this model so there could be better cultural competence, which is reaching out to all populations. And there could be more effectiveness by using evidence-based um, practices and programs. So they were research tested to be useful and effective. There are five stages, five steps to the SPIF model. The first is assessment. Another thing about the SPIF model is it's data driven. So this gave those communities and coalitions data to go back to so they could have their research proven. So the assessment, you want to go and look at your data from your community to see what your level of readiness is to identify what the issue might be in your community, 
to see what the uh, trends are, what the patterns are for the problem in your community, to see what the nature of the problem is in your community, and to see what the consequences for the behaviors around this problem in the community are. Also about looking to see what the risk and protective factors are for your community. So you want to look at the data. It will tell the story of what the problem is in your community. Once you've looked at the data and you've decided that there's a problem, you need to get the right people at the table to begin doing the work that will impact the data, doing the work that will make the change. That's building capacity. So you want to get people at the table who may be able to help you um, help you as a community make the change to, to impact the data. Once you have the people at the table, then you want to create a plan of action. So uh, the plan might be uh, some funding. How are we going to get funding to do what we want to do to impact this data? It might be deciding, do we have the right people at the table? Creating a plan might be choosing some of the evidence-based strategies um, to uh, implement to take care of the problem. And then uh, when you make this plan, you're ready to implement the plan. So you make your plan of action, and then you actually do the plan. Once you're finished with the implementation process, you want to go back and you want to evaluate your work. So did we do what we set out to do? Going back to look at the data all the time, did we, did we impact the data at all? Have we made any change? Did we have the right people at the table? Do we need to do things differently? And that, that goes to the sustainability and the cultural competence. Did our plan reach everyone? Was it accessible to everyone? And is there a way that we can continue this work? So an, an example of that might be uh, prescription drug misuse among youth. Um, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey is a national survey that we give to our high school students. All the high schools in the Monadnock region take the survey. And it, uh, it's a survey around alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use, as well as risky behaviors. And so one question on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the YRBS, is um, youth perception about access to prescription drugs without a doctor's prescription. So I think the question is, what's your perception? Is it easy to get prescription drugs without a doctor's prescription? And, um, and I'm just making this up. So I'm not really making it up. It actually is a question. But I think the percentage in the Monadnock region was something similar to 15% of our youth said that it was easy for them to get access. So we take that piece of data, and we look at that, and we say, you know, what what is the, what are some of the, what's the nature of that? So we know that prescription drug misuse can lead to addiction and can lead to the use of illicit drugs. Right now we have an epidemic of heroin on our hands and so we know that that's a concern that a possible 15% of our high school students may be misusing prescription drugs. So that's the nature of the problem. Um, what are some of the consequences? Uh, so some of the consequences could be a higher risk of crime, high school dropout, um, absenteeism. Um, so, so we're looking at the data to see if there's a problem that we want to address. So I think we decide, yes, we do. So then we want to build capacity around this problem with the youth misusing pre prescription drugs. So we want to get the right people at the table. So that might be parents who have unused, unwanted, expired medications in their home. So their youth are getting it there. It might be we want to have teachers come to the table to provide education with pre prevention materials in the schools. We might want to have pharmacies be a part of this capacity group to talk about um, a, a higher increase in opiate use or opiate prescriptions being filled in the pharmacy, something like that. So maybe law enforcement um, because it's an illegal activity. So building capacity. It's going back to the data, so this is the problem, and these are the people that we think might be able to help impact the problem. So then the next in the circle is, is the planning stage. So these gr this group gets together and they make a plan using some evidence-based strategies or best practices, um, which means the research developed to show their effectiveness. And we create a plan, so we might say, okay, why don't we get a prescription drug take-back box in our community? So what do we need to do to plan that? Well, we need money to get it, so we need to figure out how we would get some funding. Are there grants available? Do we have a grant writer at our table? Do we have somebody who might be our fiscal agent? 
So where would we have it? Well, maybe we should have it at the police station because you need 24-hour surveillance and there are federal regulations, so we want law enforcement to be there. We might want to advertise in the media so people would know to take their misused and un their, their, unex their unused expired medications to this take-back box. So there's a couple different strategies that you want to use. We want to see about funding. We want to see about media for advertising. We, again, may want to do some education in our communities, have some community forums or town hall meetings. These are all different strategies from our planning stage. And then when we have the plans in action, we're going to implement them. We're going to follow through. We're going to get this prescription take-back box and, and have it in one of our police stations. And then we're going to go back and we're going to evaluate this. And for the cultural competence piece, we want to make sure that our take-back box is in a place that's handicapped accessible, that anyone can get to at any time. Um, so for transportation needs, it's in, a, it's in a place that anybody can access. Um, we might go back to say, you know, back to the data, the 15% of youth who said they have easy access. That might take some time because the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, take, you know, trend data takes some time. But we might look at the, the amount of um, expired medications that we're getting off the street. Is that making an impact on our initial, the nature of the problem, the consequences of the problem? Is, is this uh, project making an impact on the data? So this is a, an always moving part. There's never a, okay, we're going to do this and then we're done. It's, the wheel is it's always moving. And so evaluating at all times leads to the sustainability piece. So, okay, we go back and we say, are we making a difference here? Did we do what we said we were going to do? Maybe do we need, is there still a strong need to get more medications off the street now that we've looked at what we've done? Maybe we need take back boxes in all our police departments in the region. Maybe we need to have a Monadnock region take back day every year, which really wouldn't be a bad idea. Hook it to the DeMar Marathon. So you want to go back and continue to evaluate as you go through the process for the sustainability piece. Because if you just do it and you're done, well, more than likely the funding is going to be gone and the project's going to stop. And, and the problem with drugs is that they're not going away. So you know, we need to keep the impact on the data and keep the education piece going to engage our communities. So the strategic prevention framework is a model of engagement for our communities to identify the problems in our communities around substance abuse behaviors and to um, engage folks in a process to choose the activities and strategies that we choose to address the problem. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mary, who's going to talk more in depth about some strategies. I just wanted to touch on a little piece about sustainability and cultural competence and how uh, important it is to make sure that when you're coming up with a plan for a community that uh, your evaluators for the program are culturally competent that your program, um, so for example, you're not going to take um, an evidence-based program that's typically provided in a 99% Caucasian school and try to implement it in, in a, um, on a reservation, a tribal reservation. The, the cultures don't match up. The program itself is not going to match up with the population you're trying to implement the, pro the plan with. So it's important to make sure that whenever you come up with a plan, that it's culturally competent to the population that you're trying to serve. Very important. And sustainability, Polly had touched on as well. Um, making sure that when, a good example is, is um, the coalition that I work for. We are in our second five-year grant funding cycle for a drug for community grant. Within, in, in, so the total is 10 years that we get to do this, to make this work. Once that federal funding goes away, we need to have put in place in the next four years, we're in our first year of the second five years, um, a way for us to be sustainable going forward, which means uh, making sure that we have found alternative funding sources to keep the coalition going once the federal dollars go away. And they will. That was a mistake when SAMHSA gave um, this spiff, New Hampshire was a cohort one state that received almost $11 million to implement the spiff in New Hampshire. What came out of it was um, New Hampshire divided itself into 10 regions to cover every single community with prevention. Um, 
a lot of uh, nonprofits got money. There were new coalitions that were made. Um, but the money went away after five years. And as a result of that, the people that didn't plan to sustain what they had just built in those five years, some of that went away, unfortunately. So sustainability is incredibly important. Cultural competence. I have an example of um, an event that I went to in New Hampshire. This is just to show you how embedded drinking is in New Hampshire's culture. Um, I went to an event, um, and you know, a couple hundred people there. There was a beautiful array of alcohol being served. Um, you know, the shiny lights, and there, were, there was uh, probably four or five workers behind behind the bar. And I went up and I said, can I get some water? And uh, this display was as big as my living room. So just to give you an idea, it was just missing the ice sculpture. That was the only thing missing. And, and they were, they, the one person I asked, can I get some water, she looked at her coworker. Like, that was a really weird question. And the coworker looked at me and she says, you'll get water when you're seated at your table. And, and these are, this is at an institution of adults that are working toward eliminating consumption in young adults, but yet won't model their own behaviors after the goal that they're seeking. It was just a great example, I thought, of what about all the people, like myself, who are in recovery and don't drink alcohol? And I can't get anything to drink because that's all you have as an adult in New Hampshire. I thought it was a really good example of culturally how embedded it is in New Hampshire. And if we don't, as adults in our own agencies, start to model that behavior that we want to see in our young adults, we won't change anything. So part of it is also part of this plan that we come up with is, is education and awareness. Um, OK, that was my little two cents for that. So moving on. We're going to move to um, the different types of strategies that prevention uses to um, implement in a community. The definition is that we aim at changing community standards, institutions, different structures, attitudes, and we want to change people's individual behavior, which is what I just kind of spoke about as um, adults as well, not just youth. So environmental strategies, in my coalition, that's all we're allowed to do uh, with the money that we have right now. Our current funding stream does not allow us to do individual, direct, one-on-one -on -one, um, interventions. So an environmental strategy is something that affects an entire population. It affects the entire universal, everybody, everywhere. An example is um, the policy of no smoking in restaurants. That affects anybody that eats in a restaurant. Whether you smoke or not, everybody's affected. So I'm going to give you some examples. Without going into too much detail, um, there's a lot of science behind prevention that will bore you out of your mind. So I'm not going to go there. But I am going to give you some examples of the um, strategies that we employ. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm funded by um, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. That's a federal agency. Polly is funded by the state of New Hampshire, the Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services. And we align our strategies and our missions to do the same work. We just use different words. So we are given, this is, this is what we are given on the federal level for strategies to employ. It's, it's very similar to what the state gives the, um, the polys of the state to employ. Just different words. Um, we're not required to use all seven strategies, but we try to in our planning. Um, for instance, if you go down to changing physical design, that includes things like beautification of parks, um, that, where there might be a lot of needles or uh, drug dealings, or um, adding lighting down dark alleys where there's a lot of drug dealing activity deters the dealers and they move on. We don't do a lot of that because we're not an inner city where a lot of it is required. We live in a very beautiful state and most of it um, doesn't need this kind of physical design. Uh, so we don't employ that strategy too much. We do in the sense of um, 
you know, advertising. We have alcohol retailers who advertise. We try to limit that. Uh, so providing information, let's give you some examples of that. We would disseminate information, the, the youth risk behavior survey results, we would disseminate that. We do community forums anywhere anyone wants. Um, we do things like distribute pamphlets around secondhand smoke. Um, there's, there's several different ways to provide information. We do webinars, um, trainings, we do, um, I can't think of anything else right now. Enhancing skills, same thing. Training, we provide trainings. We try to, um, I have a lot of businesses right now that are asking for trainings around identifying signs and symptoms of drug use for their staff and also for their staff to identify it in the population they're serving. So it's both for, uh, it's really on all levels that we're trying to um, educate people. And um, I'm a big believer in education, so what I do under enhancing skills is I um, encourage anyone um, to, increase, to increase New Hampshire's prevention workforce. I encourage anyone to uh, take a training that would go toward their certification as a prevention specialist, and MADAC pays for that um, to a certain point. Some of the trainings are $35 or $45, and they've gone up to $200. So um, we, I like to help people work toward that and uh, meet the requirements for the, for the certification. Uh, providing support, uh, we do a lot of referrals to whatever support is out there right now, which is mainly uh, Alcoholics Anonymous support groups, youth support groups, AA, um, what am I missing, Narcotics Anonymous, those kind of things. Uh, we are very much lacking as a state in recovery, available recovery. So um, when somebody calls me and they say, I have three kids that are heroin addicts right now, um, where can I send them? I can't, I don't have anywhere to send her because that's our treatment lack. She says, I have one kid that's trying to stay off. They're clean and sober, they're trying to stay off. Where can I send her to stay in recovery? And that's very limited as well. So in New Hampshire, some of the things that we're lacking is, our, is treatment and recovery options. Providing support can be done on any level, really, if it's an individual level, if it's on an agency level, or if it's on a, a community level, where a group like this, where several different agencies are representative, um, it's the same idea, same thing. Um, enhancing access and reducing barriers. Enhancing access to treatment and reducing barriers to treatment. Uh, that's a lot of referral that we do. And enhancing access, um, very, very difficult. <laughs> it's something that, that the state is really trying to do as a whole to um, increase our access to treatment. We don't have treatment. So increasing access to it, we're going to need to first um, begin with uh, infrastructure and capacity. We've got to get more people licensed as, as licensed alcohol and drug counselors. And we've got to get the infrastructure for treatment facilities to be able to um, provide and serve more people without burning out our current workforce. Uh, changing consequences. This involves things like uh, fines. If someone gets a DUI, the, you know, at this point, July 2013, the state changed up a lot of the penalties for, for first offense DUI, uh, driving under the influence. So one of those changing consequences, we try to um, penalize more for offenses around drug or alcohol possession or use. Um, let me think of other examples, changing consequences. Um, it's mostly possession and use. Um, I would use that as examples. Changing physical design, we already did that. We don't do much of that here, or I don't do much, um, not really. Modifying policies and procedures, that's a big one. Um, and that can be policy on any level. It can be in an educational system, in an SAU, an entire district. It can be uh, at a kind of community, le community level, at the local government um, level. We can advocate uh, for the state level policy changes that are needed, uh, and federal level. So it, really, that's on multiple levels. On the next um, slide, I have examples of what we're doing in the, in the Monadnock region now. Uh, the big thing in the middle, got alcohol. 
This stat, Maydat came up with, we didn't come up with it, we came up with the ad that uh, quotes a statistic that came out of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which actually cited that 67% of kids get their alcohol from home or the home of a friend. So we decided to put something like this together because if that's, if that's what's happening, then the adults and the parents need to be more responsible about the alcohol that they bring in the house. Um, not that it's just the adults and the parents. It could be an older sibling or an, you know, an uncle. Um, so we said gut alcohol along the lines of the gut milk. Um, did you know two or three kids get, two out of three kids get their alcohol from home in the home of a friend? Please lock it up. We've since added an image of a prescription bottle to also lock up your meds. Um, real estate uh, agents are now also showing houses that have these lock boxes in them, medicine, medicine boxes, medicine cabinets with lock boxes on them. Uh, because a lot of, sometimes the open houses, the people aren't there and they have medications in there that are being stolen. And if the house is empty, uh, they show it as it's a feature. It's a feature in the house. Oh, this, this medicine cabinet comes with a, a lock. Uh, we did, let's see, we partnered with the Drug Enforcement Administration for the past four and a half years. I'm, it's over five years now. And uh, statewide pulled together twice a year. We had a uh, prescription drug take back program, which Polly spoke about. And in Cheshire County, we took in over 1,800 pounds of excess, expired, or unused medications that were returned and incinerated. They were trucked to an incinerator. Statewide, it was over 44,000 pounds, 22 tons, almost 22 tons, uh, which I took this down, this particular um, success that our, that our state had, took it down to DC and um, showed other new grantees about the importance of partnering in order to get something done that's meaningful. And at the same time to make sure that if you're gonna do something like this, and, and if you have any kind of awareness about how many people are already addicted to prescription drugs, and you're gonna take away their supply but not reduce the demand to make sure that on the other end of a strategy you put in place something to support those people that are currently addicted, if you're not gonna give them treatment. One of the things is that we don't know that we didn't do is contribute to the heroin problem by removing the supply and not the demand, not lowering the demand. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I struggle with is that I, we didn't put anything in place while we, while we did this. Uh, the synthetics ordinance was a very successful thing that was driven by a parent that had come to us and said, I have a friend whose kid's addicted to synthetic drugs. Uh, what are you guys doing about it and how can I help? And she drove this movement um, that ended up going to the city council, Keene City Council, and getting an ordinance drawn up with the help of several lawyers with new futures, with police department, um, Ken Miola. Uh, a lot of people were involved in the um, language and making sure that this ordinance was um, incredibly um, comprehensive to remove synthetics from retailers' shelves. They're basically uh, legal, chemically altered marijuana. It's like marijuana sprinkled with a whole bunch of different chemicals every time. So nobody really knows what's in them. Uh, the problem with having them removed one at a time, which was what the DEA was trying to have done, is that when they were banning chemicals that were in these products, they were only doing three or four at a time. The manufacturers were in the room as the chemicals were being banned and had a new product on the shelf by the next morning. If we keep doing it like that, we're gonna be behind forever. There's thousands of chemicals to choose from. So what we did instead was, let's draw up an ordinance that tells our retailers to remove these products from the shelves, make it illegal to sell them. And it was a success, it was passed, and it was brought to the state of New Hampshire and is now being used as a template statewide. Very successful. And that was parent driven. That was a citizen that brought it to us. We were able to help her roll with it. That's the three of those. Okay. So what Polly is um, 
trying to do is to create, what, not Polly, but all of us are trying to create this um, system of care that's, that's based on resiliency. Human beings are resilient by nature. And we've been forgetting about recovery uh, big time in this state. So the state recognizes that and is trying to do something about it now. And they've created this, what they call, R, we're, we're, we love acronyms. That's the whole prevention language. So the RROSC, Resiliency and Recovery Oriented System of Care. This provides the system of uh, the continuum of care that includes all the elements that we're going to need going forward to partner together, to work together. Promotion of health throughout. You'll notice it's on the bottom. It goes throughout the entire continuum of care. And it's also the first segment of it. The promotion of health can't be um, understated about how important it is to constantly pr be promoting health at every venue throughout that whole continuum of care. Um, and that's my introduction of it. So Polly's going to go into a little bit more detail. I did want to do one thing. When I was talking about policies, I knew I was going to forget to do this. I wanted to show you the example of um, recommendations that the, that the state put out of, uh, to change school policies. Uh, that was a, something that happened at Keene High School. Like Lauren had mentioned, we met several different people throughout the community met. We reviewed this and took from it um, some of the concepts in how to uh, make the school's policy, the district's policy, I should say, it was the district to change the policy, a little less punitive and a lot more supportive, which was, which was one of the stronger suggestions in this whole. Um, and this can be found if you just, if you go, I think it's everywhere. It's at the New Hampshire Center for Excellence. They have it. New Hampshire Bureau for Drug and Alcohol Services has it. And the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation has it. It is called... Um, alcohol and other drug policy recommendations for schools. Mary and I will just add, I have a couple copies of this over on the counter if anybody wants one. I was going to make one for everyone for the binders, but I was having some computer issues yesterday. But there are several copies of that yep. recommended school policy over on the side if anybody needs one. And just a little more about the Keene School District policy. We did this work last spring into the summer and uh, Keene High School implemented this, well it's K through 12, so they implemented this policy into their schools this past year and will be reconvening to go back, as we talked about with the SPIF, pro the SPIF, pro SPIF process, that we need to go back and evaluate how it worked for the, for the schools. And so we can see if, it was, if what we did was what we were supposed to do or if we need to go back and make some more changes. So again, it's that ever-changing. We're always going back and, and reassessing and, and evaluating to make sure that we're still hitting the target that we're trying to get. So thank you very much, Mary. Um, this pretty much ends our program for today. I just want to touch on the, the ROSC is this whole education piece that we're trying to bring to you is that integrated system of care for substance use disorder through the continuum so that anybody anywhere in any stage of their problem with a substance use issue, they can get some kind of services, some kind of help, some kind of uh, resource if we have an integrated system so we can continue to build on that. So prevention fits in as part of the continuum, the, as Mary said, the promotion of it all. People in recovery coming in to do a speaking engagement are a piece of the prevention. People in prevention talking about the language of recovery. So it's one continuous movement. Prevention's always, always moving. We're never, ever just finished. Whenever we get done with one thing, something else comes in. So it's an ever-moving target. So we're going to have questions if you, we're going to answer questions if you have any, but I want to announce that the, there's a flyer on your table for the next two learning sessions. We had the overview session on March 13th, and then we broke that down into four learning sessions. Last month was What's the Problem? We had Tim Rourke from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and Rick Van Wickler from, he's the superintendent right here at the jail. They came and spoke about the problem, the social and financial impacts on our region. Today, Mary and I have both touched a little bit about prevention. As Mary said, prevention can get very wordy and acronymy, so we just kind of gave you a, you know, a very quick, quick version as to how we choose the activities that we choose, some local examples of what we've done. And then next month, it'll be treatment and recovery. And in the fall, we'll be doing integration. So some interesting sessions coming up. 
There's a date change on the one in September that's in red on your flyer. You'll note that. We had to change, uh, change it up a week. And uh, now is when I, I would be happy, or Mary would be happy, we could answer any questions if you have any. And I would just ask if you do, if you would go to the microphone. Okay. Well, great. Feel free to network, and, and there's information over here on the tables. We have our lending library. Um, and Mary and I will both be here if you want to ask any questions that you didn't necessarily want to go to the microphone for. I thank you all very much for coming today. This is part of the FAC work to um, get, learn more about the substance use disorder through the continuum of care so that as we move down the road in the future that possible funding opportunities that come down through the public health network, you'll be the decision makers for that and you'll be knowledgeable and feel comfortable making the decisions about where to allocate that funding. So again, thank you all very much for coming today.